Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. You know, as we were singing these Christmas hymns and carols, I love that. It reminds me of all the wonderful memories that I had as a child. Being blessed to grow up in a Christian home, and having a mom and a dad teach me about Jesus Christ and the birth of the Savior. And, and we indulged in Santa Claus, you know, but my mom always made sure that Santa Claus was inferior to Jesus. In fact, we had a manger scene where Santa Claus was on his knees, kneeling before the Savior. Amen. And uh, and Santa Claus isn't necessarily a bad figure. He was a, a, a historical figure that honored the birth of Christ by giving gifts to little children and stuff. Of course, we've taken Santa Claus and turned him into an omnipotent, all-knowing, all-seeing person, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the one that you should be worried about whether you're naughty or nice, not not Santa Claus. And he is. He does have a list, and he's checking it twice, and and he knows his own and stuff. And so, in Luke chapter two, we're going to take a look at. An incredible event in the history of mankind. I don't think we realize how huge this event was. Because without the Spirit of God, without the, the news of, of, of the gospel, this is a dark, dreary place. In fact, we saw a, a, a week ago that, that, that a light came into the darkness and, and people who walked in the darkness saw a great light and this great light has been shining for you know well for all eternity really but but for those who are caught up in history almost 2,000 years and so let's let's give our attention to the Word of God verse 1 Luke chapter 2 verse 1 we're gonna read the first 20 verses and then we're gonna I hope you have your fingers ready because we're gonna be in Micah we're gonna be all over the place so get your pens ready if you're taking notes. Uh, it'll be an interesting trip. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus and all the, that all the world should be registered. Let me stop there. God moved the entire world for this event. The census first took place while Quinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, because remember, that's where they lived. He, they, they lived in Galilee. Out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Joseph had a curse on him. If you know anything about uh, blood curses, there was a blood curse put on the royal line, and Joseph was part of the royal line. And so he was able to inherit the house of David. But it was Mary who gave him the lineage of David because she was part of the noble family that did not have the blood curse, but she was also a member of the house of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, the virgin bride. Here we have a continuation of all that we've learned in the scripture. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were greatly afraid. When, then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. There is no greater message than the gospel. For there is born unto you in this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And when they came with haste and found that Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger, now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told of them concerning this child. And all those who heard 
heard it, marveled at those things which were told of them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Quite a story. There's a lot of celebrating, a lot of praising, a lot of life. Because that's what Jesus Christ is all about. He is life. He is eternal life. Now, I, what I want to do is I want to look at this from a little bit of a different angle. It's not your traditional Christmas message. First, I want to say that, that God, in His prophetic word, is specific. God is very precise in His, in his, in his, in his word. In Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 10, it talks about Shiloh coming. And that the scepter would not leave the tribe of Judah until Shiloh came. And Shiloh is a messianic term. Shiloh is Jesus Christ. For he is the Messiah. In Isaiah 7.14, we are told that a virgin would be with child. And we read, we read that in the Gospels, how the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and impregnated her. Joseph did not impregnate Mary the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary because if Joseph had impregnated Mary, then the blood curse that was on Joseph would have been on Jesus. And God knew, God knew the, God knows everything. He knows when we're good. He knows when we're bad. And he knows when we're going to succeed and when we fail him. And he knew that Jeconiah a king of Judah would fail so badly that he would put a blood curse on him. And Satan probably thought, oh great, I got God over a barrel. He told David that one of his sons would sit on his throne forever, but then he just cursed the entire bloodline. How was God going to do that? And I could see God saying to Gabriel, come here Gabriel, watch this. We're going to do an end run around devils, the devil's schemes. And we're going to have the virgin be impregnated by the Holy Spirit to avoid the blood curse, but yet continue to give that same promise to David in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Because remember, the son that was going to sit on the throne of David was going to rule and sit on that throne forever. So you'd have to be God. In Isaiah 9, verses 7 and 6, we see the titles. And we, that Last week, that was our sermon. We saw the titles. Counselor, Wonderful, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Eternal Father. That prophecy predicted that this individual would not just be a human being, but he would be God, both God and man, the child representing his humanity and the son representing his deity. And it all comes to conclusion, really, or to, to a degree of conclusion, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, when God gave a numerical formula for the Jews to figure out the very day that the Messiah would come to Israel and present himself as Messiah. And because they failed to do that, God knew, and God knew that they were going to, God had the church, had us in his heart. I've been told that the birth of Jesus Christ is the proof of God's extreme and unending love for us. And I believe that. That he would become one of us and dwell amongst us and show us what it's like to be a perfect human being. So in this tale, I'd like to, I'd like to look at three things. I'd like to look at the shepherds. I'd like to look at the sign. And I'd like to look at the story. First, let's take a look at these shepherds. These shepherds were not ordinary people. They were not ordinary people. They were not commoners. They were shepherding priests from the temple. They were giving birth to sacrificial lambs so they could be without blemish and without, for the sacrifices. So what is this talk of a manger? What, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our traditions don't quite own up to what the Word of God says. We come close. But I don't believe that Jesus Christ was born in a manger that had animals in it. At least not multiple animals. It did have sheep where he was born, but not animals. 
What is this manger? Well, we know from Micah 5.2 that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. But guess what? God didn't stop at just the city in which the Messiah was to be born. He picked out the very building that Jesus was to be born. Turn with me in your Bibles to Micah chapter 4, verse 8. Micah chapter 4, verse 8. It's a very interesting verse. It says, And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come. What shall come? Even the former dominion shall come, and the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. The kingdom of God was going to come to this tower of the flock. What is the tower of the flock? The tower of a flock is an actual building in the fields of Bethlehem. It was a stone building that priestly shepherds used to keep sacrificial lambs from being injured or trampled or blemished. The sheep were born, actually, in this building, and they were wrapped in strips of cloth made from old priestly garments. The sheep would be placed in the manger so they wouldn't get trampled. So when these shepherds saw Jesus wrapped in strips of priestly cloth lying in the tower, they must have been excited beyond description because their very prophet Micah told them this would happen five centuries before Christ was born. They were the only ones who could understand this sign because they were the ones that tended the fields of David at night. This was a royal ownership. Think about it. David was king. <clears throat> this, is, this is not your commoner's property. This is the king of Israel's property. Even though long since deposed as kings, it's still royal property. Look at the British monarchy. Not much left to it is there, but yet they still hold privilege and special treatment. The sign was just for them, and it was personal. The swaddling clothes of Jesus were probably the same source of clothing as the lambs. And it's quite likely that Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who was married to a priest by the name of Zechariah, could have gotten those priestly swaddling clothes from her. These historical observations and parallels are confirmed by many Messianic rabbis and a historical writer by the name of Alfred Eldershine. It's recent. In fact, the name of the Tower of the Flock is Mid Mid Migadel Elder. And it was recently discovered and found. And it was a two-level building. On the top was a watchtower so that the, these, these priestly shepherds could keep an eye on the fields, upon the sheep in the fields at night. And on and the, and the second, the first floor, was the birthing chamber for the sheep. And Jesus, it is believed, was birthed in the birthing chamber of all those other sheep who were set aside to be a sacrifice for the sins of, that, of each family. In fact, they would put the name of each family on the neck. They would tie something around the neck of the sheep and they would put the family name so that they wouldn't mix up the sheep. And so these Jewish people could perform what the Word of God called them to do. Picking out a lamb without spot or blemish. Tamim. Which gives us an interesting clue in Genesis chapter 6 with some really creepy stuff. This insight makes the shepherd's re, uh, reaction more colorful. Can you imagine? You're seeing Bible prophecy being revealed before your very own eyes for the first time. 
I can remember when I first started studying Bible prophecy and I learned about the prophecy of Israel coming back into the land. I learned about uh, this prophecy and that prophecy and how exciting it was. And the most exciting prophecy to me was the Daniel 9 prophecy where the Messiah was predicted to come to Israel on a specific day. And all how that related to the church. David Schittler revealed that each Jewish family would put their name on the lambs in the tower and that name was put around their neck. And the early pictures of Jesus on the cross have a small sign, okay, which, which had an I, an N, an R, and another I capitalized. And that is found in John chapter 19, 19. And each of the first letters was, was, were the nouns in Latin and it was the Yahweh sign. It was the Tetra Amatron, the unspeakable name of God. Why do you think the Pharisees were so upset and told, and told um, Pilate to take that down? Because he was declaring that the one who hung on that cross was Yahweh. Amen. Almighty God. I think back to the exchange between Pilate and the nation of Israel in that day. Understanding the historical references of the time, the Jews hated the, the Romans. The Romans were conquerors, and they were brutal, and they were mean. They would bust into your house and take your stuff, take your people, take, you know, make you carry their military equipment into battle. And they hated the Romans. But the funny thing is, when it came to choosing Jesus or the Romans, you know what they said? Crucify him. Crucify him. And when Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? They, what did they say? We have no king but Caesar. Are you kidding me? Truly, Jesus walked into a very dark world. Of course, we don't talk about that at Christmas because we, you know, we, we end our Christmas with gifts. Preacher, you're bringing a bummer to the Christmas story by talking about the crucifixion. Not to me. That story is my redemption. That story is my get out of jail. Not free, costly. The blood of the Lamb of God who was born in the tower of the flock. These shepherds were priests in David's field. They were from the temple. They were giving birth to sacrificial lambs and they were protecting the sheep at night. And you know what this tells us? This tells us, I'm sorry folks, it wasn't December 25th when Jesus was born because no shepherd in his right mind would be in the fields of Israel in the middle of the winter because the sheep would die. It's most likely that this occurred in the fall. Somewhere between September 26th and September 29th. I think it was September 28th, but that's just my own personal opinion. I won't tell you why I think that. <laughs> Some of you know why. The shepherds understood. Look at what they did. It says in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 verse 8 says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The glory of God. I imagine the fields were lit up with light. I don't think it was dark at all when those angels showed, when the angel of the Lord showed up. And they were freaked out. Wouldn't you be freaked out? Here you are in the field, you're doing your job, all of a sudden, bright lights, supernatural beings flying in the air. Sounds like UFOs, right? And what do they do? It says, And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This wasn't just for Israel. This was for everyone. No longer was God going to make a division between Jew and Gentile. God was about to create his body, the body of Christ, which is those who are near and those who are far off brought together 
to serve one Lord, one God, one faith, with one baptism. You see, because before that, guys, most of us here would have been left out because we're not Jewish. We would be idol-worshipping pagans. My ancestors that lived in the old country, because I know my ancestors in the new country in America worship Jesus. I have a, a preacher in my lineage who was part of the Great Awakening in the 1700s. So I know some of my, my, my ancestors worship the one true God, at least the ones in America. But what about the ones in Scandinavia and in England before this great move of the gospel into Europe. They worship stones and bugs and, and birds and nature. The sign of the tower was a in your face, look at what I'm doing to you, for you mankind. I am telling you, in this building, in these fields, in this town, I am giving birth to one who is eternal. Amen. One who will be the Emmanuel, God with us. The one who will be the Savior that will save his people from their sins. And I, you know, the Jews are such blessed people. And they will be more blessed in the end than even we, if you study Bible prophecy. If you look at Jeremiah 31, 31 and Isaiah 59, there are some fantastic things that God says about the Jewish people, but only after they've suffered the great tribulation. You see, these people, these preachers who would try to tell you that the great tribulation is for the church, they don't know what they're talking about. It's not for the church. For several reasons. Let me give you a couple. First of all, when Jesus died on the cross, we are told that he suffered God's wrath once. And Hebrews tells us that if you try to put him under wrath, you're re-crucifying Jesus. We don't do that. He goes, I know better of you. I know you aren't doing that, he says to the Hebrews. And Hebrews says that he would only suffer the wrath of God once. So let me just put it to you this way. What are we? We're the body of Christ, are we not? He's the head, we're the body. Are we connected to Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Ephesians chapter 2 makes that very clear. It says, we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You might be saying, preacher, my feet are on earth. Your feet may be on earth, but your spirit connected to the Holy Spirit, is in heaven with Almighty God. That's why we can go into the throne room of God with boldness. Because we are connected to the Father. We are connected to the Son. We are connected to the Holy Spirit. And I thank Daddy for that. My Daddy gives the best gifts. My Daddy is the strongest Daddy in the universe. My daddy is the most loving daddy in the universe. Amen. And I'm not talking about Nelson Sr. I'm talking about Daddy God. So as these priestly shepherds see this baby in the tower of the flock, wrapped in priestly garments, what a sign! Is not Jesus our great high priest? Is he not our king of kings? He was born in a royal place with priestly garments because he's a king and a priest. In fact, he's the high priest. He's the high priest over priests. Revelation chapter 1 verses 4 through 6 tells us that we, the church, that we are kings and priests unto our God. And there's only three sets of people that are kings and priests. Melchizedek, and he's a mystery. I think he's just epiphanies of the Old Testament. Jesus Christ showing up in bodily form. But the other two groups are Jesus Christ 
who is a king and a priest, and the church. We are kings and priests. Represented by the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 5, where these elders sitting on thrones below the throne of God identify themselves as being bought by the blood of the Lamb from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. That's not Israel, because Israel's not every nation and every tribe, tongue, and language. It's not angels, because God doesn't give angels crowns. They're ministering servants. It's people saved from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. And who is that? That is the church. Amen. Reason number two. Reason number three that I know that the church isn't going to go into the tribulation is the fact that when you look at that Daniel 9 prophecy, it's a 490 year prophecy broken into two parts. The first part is 483 years and it gives the very number of days, it predicts the very day that the Messiah would present himself to the nation of Israel. And if you plug in the proper year, you see, we're used to a 365 day year, but in Bible prophecy, it's not, they don't use a 365 day year, they use a 360 day year. And when you plug in 360 days into 483 years, now get this, don't get too excited, you'll have 173,880 days. Praise God, right? We should praise God because that prophecy not only gives us a numerical count, it gives us the trigger that started that prophecy. And that trigger was when Artaxerxes Longimanus, a Greek king, gave Nehemiah, the prophet, the right to rebuild the city, the wall, the streets, and the temple. And it's the only prophecy that gives that. All the other decrees given in the Old Testament were simply just for the temple. But this one was for the city and the temple and the walls and the streets. And that prophecy says that it will be in a time when the cities, the streets, and the walls are being rebuilt. It's a specific prophecy. And so on April 6, 32 AD, that prophecy came and was fulfilled. And for us, the church, Glorious for the nation of Israel. Bummer. You know why? Because they failed to recognize the time of their visitation. If you read that passage carefully, as Jesus is coming over the crest to the city, as he looks down upon Jerusalem, he weeps when he should be doing a rocky moment, right? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, prophecy fulfilled. Now, 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 yeah! Devil going down! But he doesn't do that. He weeps and then he prophesies against the Jewish people. He bemoans the fact that I'm like a, a hen and you're like my chicks and I desire to gather you under my wings, but you would not. And because you would not, you will not see me again until you see me come in my glory. And that's at the end of the tribulation. That's when the Jewish people call Jesus back to the earth. You can read about that in Hosea 5 and 6. Very specific prophecies. So the story of the Messiah is enlarged. The sign in the city of David, Bethlehem, in the tower of the flock, with a babe wrapped in priestly garments, and what do, the, what do the shepherds do? Go back home and, you know, start baking pies and wrapping gifts and saying, oh, praise God? Well, they did praise God, but they did more than that. And if you, you it, let's read on this passage. This is such a, uh, and, and you know this is an important passage because Linus from the Peanuts <laughs> quotes this. He is, a, he is, in my opinion, a strong authority for God. And suddenly there was with the 
the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Now I know in the little stories, the, the, you know, the, the shepherds go into the city of Bethlehem first and then go out to, to go to the manger. But no, they're in the fields surrounding Bethlehem, the royal fields of David, and they say, hey, let's go into Bethlehem. Let's see this thing. Let's see this child wrapped in priestly garments, swaddling. Verse 16, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph lying in a manger. I think we can learn from that. Do we make haste to learn the things of God? I hope you do. I, I have to admit, lately, I think I've been a little slow, a little lethargic. And God has rebirthed, a, a, a rekindled in me a desire to make haste to know the will of God, to see the, the, the might and power of God. I want to see the glory of God fall on this congregation. I want to see the glory of God fall on my family. I want to see the glory of God fall on my country. I want to see a great awakening in America like we've never had before. Because we need it. Desperately. There are demonic forces that are very powerful, very insidious, and very much connected with other demonic forces all around the world plotting the demise of the American Republic because we are a thorn in their side and we are a fly in the ointment because we believe in freedom and they're a bunch of tyrants. They want to tell you what you can and cannot believe. They want to tell you where you can live. They want to tell you what you can do. They want to tell you what you can eat. They're tyrants. They want to tell you to shut up. You can't speak your mind. Don't you dare say this about this group or don't you dare say... You can't criticize certain groups in America anymore. Why? Because the politically correct have said so. And the American public has bought into it. And the media promotes it. And it's time for us to say, no more. Like telling me I can't say Merry Christmas because I'm going to offend the Muslim. Too bad. I'm supposed to offend the Muslim. The gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to those who are perishing. But what's the point of the offense? To tick them off? No. The point of the offense is to get them to think. It's to get them to, to, to ponder. Why is this crazy preacher saying Merry Christmas when he could get the snot beat out of him? Why? I had a Muslim guy ask me, why do you bring your Bible to class when I was at Westfield State College? And I told him, I said, this is my bread. This is my map. This is my sword. This is my light. And it tells me about the one who lives inside me. And he is God Almighty. So the shepherd priests go to Bethlehem and they see the tower and they make haste to see the sign. And they knew that God had revealed to them personally. And they're they're telling everyone. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the sayings which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told of them by the shepherds. Now, what would be so awe-inspiring of a baby just simply lying in a, in a manger with other animals? Like a donkey and a sheep, you know. Uh, you, know what, what, you know, my favorite Christmas story, other than the Christmas story itself, is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? Has a very shiny nose. The other reindeer wouldn't let him play the reindeer games until Rudolph rescues the day. My second favorite Christmas story, other than the gospel, I want to make that clear. I want you going, oh, pastors become a pagan, is the little drummer boy. It's, it's a, it's, it's a I, I cry every time I watch it because that poor little drummer boy, he's so poor. And he's only, all he got is his animal friends and that, that mean old merchant dude, you know, you know sold his, his buddies to those evil slave traders. 
and, and the little lamby gets run over by the mean Romans. And the little drummer boy has to bring the lamb before, the, before Jesus Christ and pray a, play a song on his drums, begging Almighty God to heal his lamb. Most of that's just silly, except for the healing part. Because that's exactly what God does. He heals infirmities. He heals broken relationships. And he heals desperate and broken countries as well. You know, there's been a, 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 a I won't say a swarm, but several countries who have elected Christians as their presidents. Why? Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We have the freedom of America living inside of us. We are the ones that will bring freedom to this country, not because we're any better than anyone else, but because of the one who lives inside of us is the freedom. Without Jesus, there is no freedom. There's only death, darkness, and destruction. There's only envy, jealousy, war, famine, plague, you name it. Vengeance. Our, what does our God say about vengeance? He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Let me take care of the vengeance part. Don't you do it. You know why? Because we don't do it right. We go too far. Because we're sinful. Even as believers, we would go too far. Because of our sin nature. And that's why God says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Because he knows what the result is of our vengeance. You know what it does? It just creates more vengeance. You avenge yourself on your enemies, then they avenge themselves on you. And then you avenge yourselves on your enemies, and then they avenge themselves on you. You avenge yourselves on your enemies, and then they avenge them. And you know what? There have been people groups all over the world that have been going through centuries of taking their vengeance out on each other. Tribes in Af Africa would plunder one another, steal their stuff, and sell their people into slavery. So then that other tribe would then plunder them and steal their stuff and slave their, send their people into slavery. And it's just an ongoing vengeance, vengeance, vengeance. And only the gospel of Jesus Christ can stop that madness. Amen. War is horrible. Sometimes war is necessary, though. I, I'm not a pacifist. The Bible tells me that the leader of my nation is given the sword for a reason to defend the nation and to punish the evildoers. Okay? But I would much rather have mercy applied than war. But sometimes we have no choice. History has shown us that. When Hitler rose up, we had no choice. He was so evil, so demon-possessed, and if you study the, the, the Nazi regime, they were hip-deep into the occult. So don't play around with the occult. Witches and, and, and crystal balls and tarot cards and, and all that stuff are entries for demonic spirits to mess with you personally and to mess with a nation. Why, you know, think about it. Why did God make dealing with the occult a capital crime in the Old Testament if it wasn't so serious? But yet we... We treat the occult with, especially in our pop culture, with kid gloves. Oh, Samantha, the good witch. He's a good witch. I'd rather have a sandwich than a good witch. The marvel of the Messiah is this. Do you know that Jesus Christ the prophecies that he fulfilled are impossible to be fulfilled randomly. They, it was done on purpose. Just eight prophecies has to be done on, on purpose. If you calculate the odds, and, and I'm talking about being very you know, conservative with the odds, eight prophecies are impossible for one man to fulfill randomly. Never mind 300. And guess what? There's still 1,800 more prophecies to be fulfilled from the Old Testament. 
Why, why don't we read the Old, Test Old Testament more? You know why? Because the Old Testament is a testament that has hundreds of unfulfilled prophecies. And God knew that this would discourage the Jewish people to a degree because God knows everything. He has a time. Remember when the, when, the, when the disciples came up to Jesus after he rose from the dead and he'd spent 50 days with them, showing them infallible proofs of his existence. And they were all excited. They were like, okay, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Oh, yeah. Jesus is going to whoop those Romans. And what did Jesus say? Yeah, we're going to go whoop them, boys. Follow me. I got my sword. We're going to take them down. We're going to show them who's boss. No. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times and epods which the Father has established. And there are times and epods established by God that we don't know. Um, one called uh, the rapture. The return of Jesus Christ for his church. No man knows the day or the hour. No man. We don't know the day or the hour. But... Thank God for 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says we can know the times and seasons. And I believe that we are in the season of that incredible event. Oh, so pastor, are you just going to go on vacation and wait for the rapture to happen? Take it easy? No. Because in Luke 19, Jesus said, Occupy until I come. Another translation says, Do business until I come. What business? The business of the cross. Going into all the world and preaching the gospel. Going to every nation, teaching them everything that Jesus taught us. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a supernatural mission that we are upon. And we are called to be soldiers of the cross. That do not entangle ourselves with civilian affairs. But seek to serve our, our Master our commander-in-chief. Do you know that that's basically what Yahweh is? He's the commander-in-chief. He's, he's an army general. He's equivalent to our president in the American political scene. And we're, we're, we see in this passage, let's read the last couple of verses, says, but smart people ponder. You know where we got the saying, still waters run deep? Right here. Mary was a very deep person. She saw it all. Right? She's the one that talked to Gabriel. Gabriel told her, God's going to be born in you. His name is Emmanuel. God with us. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's what the name Jesus means. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Do you ponder? I do. And you know what? One of the best ways to ponder the things of God? Scripture memorization. Bible study. Scriptorial familiarity. Create new words here. Do we know this book well enough to give a defense for the hope that lies in us. If someone were to ask me, do you really think there is a God? I would say, absolutely. No doubt whatsoever. And if they said, what is your proof? I would say to them, Bible prophecy. Because Revelation 19.10 has a phrase in it that says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And these specific prophecies tell us of a person who was created, not created, who was ordained by the Father to be the firstborn among the firstborn. We're the first fruits, and he's the firstborn among the first fruits. Do you ever see that, run into that phrase somewhere in the word? We need to get to a point where we can connect the dots, the context of the whole. Because the more we know God's word, the more focus our mission becomes in our eyes. The less we know about God, the less focus things become. The less on fire we are. See, I, I truly believe that pastors should be preaching 
Bible prophecy that it would set their congregations on fire. But sadly, it's being discarded by many evangelical churches. Why? Well, we don't want to offend anyone. We're so afraid to offend. We've bought into the politically correct mind frame that you can't ever offend anyone. And I'm not saying that we should go out and be offensive. That's not what I'm talking about. But we need to stand up for that which might offend others who don't believe in it. We can be nice about it. I think Angie and I had a little bit of a go like that when we first met. And now Angie's part of the church. Mary pondered, the shepherds praised. Guys, that's our job, to ponder the things of Christmas and to give praise about the marvels of Almighty God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the tower of the flock. I thank you for these prophecies that are so precise and so specific that it, randomness can't even play a part in them because it's impossible. These were specific acts done by a specific person for a specific reason with a specific result. And that is the creation of the nation of Israel and the creation of the church of Jesus Christ so that the world can be saved from the flames of hell. So God, I pray in Jesus' name, I pray for the unsaved in America who are wandering and who are walking in a dark place. I pray that the light would shine upon them. That they would listen to a preacher somewhere, somehow, at some time, that would just pull back the curtain and reveal to them the glory of God. And that they would get saved. That they would fall on their knees and ask God to forgive them of their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray that you would do this in the millions. I pray that the millions of American pagans would get saved, Father God. I pray that the billions of, of, of worldwide pagans would get saved, God. Lord, we want you to depopulate hell. But Lord, we know you're a gentleman. You don't force yourself upon anyone. You have to be invited. And in order for you to be invited, they must be told. So Lord, help us to tell them. Thank you, God, for my memories with you. They're sweet. My days in the Christian Missionary Alliance, when we sang the, the old hymns, my days in Pioneer Valley Assembly of God, when I knew, learned the new choruses and ran into a group called Striper. I thank you for my days here in First Congregational Church that is a culmination of all these things. I have been blessed. My life has been full. You have been glorious. And Lord, I pray that we as a body of Christ would be on fire, that we'd be like these shepherds, these, these priestly shepherds, because we're priests. And you, and you give a crown to those who feed the sheep. That's one of the five crowns mentioned in the scripture. Help us to be such priestly shepherds that we would lead many into the kingdom of God. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.